before, talking about the second generation. We're going to talk about the first generation, which was analog. But first, let's talk about sound. If I speak, I have some vocal cords down here, maybe. And I have lungs here, maybe. So air goes up through the lungs, <laughs> past the vocal cords and starts to vibrate and out uh, through my mouth comes these um, compressed and decompressed air waves. And on the other end, there is maybe a person with an ear, Looked maybe something like this. <laughs> uh, and the ear receives the uh, compressed and decompressed air. The brain perceives uh, these compressed and uh, decompressed air waves as sound. If we have normal air pressure here, that's about one bar. And when the air is compressed, so this pressure is here. When the air is compressed, the pressure goes up like this, and when it's decompressed, the pressure goes down like this. So, if this is a kind of a sine wave, similar waveform, so up here, the air is compressed, and down here, the air is decompressed. So it's compressed and decompressed, and if you count the number of peaks per second, that's the tone of this signal. So for instance, if there's 440 peaks per second, then uh, the tone is an A in the middle of the piano. Yeah, and uh, now, uh, if you transmit this as analog radio, you start with radio, uh, carrier wave, it's a waveform, just a sine wave going up, down like this, pretty fast, so this is typical, uh, the carrier wave is typical uh, between 88 to 108 megahertz. So the carrier wave of the radio signal is much faster, has much higher frequency than the audio that is being transmitted. And if the carrier wave is unmodified, it means that, that it's no signal at all, it's silent. But if I want to transmit this signal, there are two ways to modify the carrier wave, that's called modulation. So I can either modify the amplitude of the carrier wave or the frequency of the carrier wave, that's called amplitude mod modulation or frequency modulation, AM or FM radio. So the amplitude kind of carrier wave goes up like this, and then it goes down to almost zero, then it goes up again, and then it goes down. Yeah, so the amplitude, that's the le height of these waves, and uh, it uh, corresponds to the compression of the air. Uh, while if you're, that's AM radio, AM, or FM radio, then you instead modify the frequency. So when it goes up, it goes up, you have a higher frequency, and when it goes down, you have lower frequency, up goes higher frequency, and down goes. Now you might be wondering how these compressions and decompressions from the mouth <laughs> are being translated into an electric signal over here. So you have a microphone, and a cable out to the microphone, into some equipment, and out to the equipment comes the electrical signals. So what typically happens in this microphone, if you open it up, you have some kind of membrane, and this membrane starts to vibrate when the compressed and decompressed air hits the membrane. And attached to this membrane is some kind of coil, and this coil moves within a magnetic field, and then electricity is generated, an electric signal. A waveform, electric waveform of the audio, is uh, modulated before transmitting it from a radio tower. Uh, this radio tower, 
large radio tower, like antenna, which is transmitted all over the area. So if one radio tower transmits in this area, I call this radio tower number one, then I have another radio tower transmitting in this area, area number two. There is some overlap here between area one and area two, and because of that overlap, you don't want the frequencies to be same in area one and area two. Have the same frequencies as area one, it can't have the same frequencies as area two. If we add another radio tower, when you have one, two, and three as neighbors. So maybe I have to add the fourth one. Uh, but this is the limit. So there's a, a theorem called the four color theorem, and it says if you want to draw areas like this, and no neighboring two areas have the same number or same color, it will always be enough with four colors, so that no adjacent areas have the same color. So you could plan the frequency range for an entire country using only four sets of frequencies. So the first generation of mobile phones were analog, or, and uh, at least in Sweden, they were transmitted using FM frequency modulation at the 450 megahertz band. So it's faster than a normal radio. If you bought specialized equipment, you could get 450 megahertz radio, FM radio, and that's what's called a scanner. And a scanner typically could scan between different frequencies. So you could put in 450 megahertz and some other frequencies, maybe for police radio and so on and so forth. And it, they all transmitted in FM radio audio. And the mobile phone too transmitted uh, phone audio using just the same technique as normal uh, radio stations. The difference is that the mobile phone tower is not only transmitting audio, it's all it's transmitting audio to the phone. Here is a phone with screen and buttons. <laughs> so it's transmitting voice audio to the phone, and when you speak into the phone, the mobile tower is also receiving audio from the phone. So it's transmitting and receiving, and that's called a transceiver. The tower does not only uh, transmit phone audio, you know, you have to dial a telephone number and so on, and uh, then you have to do some called, something that's called signaling, and the signaling is not transmitted using FM radio, it was at least in the Nordic mo mobile telephone network was transmitted using FFS key, fast frequency shift key. Transmit digital data like this, one and a zero, maybe a one and maybe a zero again. So you want to transmit bits of ones and zeros. Uh, and um, you have the, but it's the same technique, you have a carrier wave, which is like this. And when you really want to transmit the one, you increase the frequency. And when you Transmit to zero, you decrease the frequency. And you want to transmit to one, you increase the frequency, and so on. So that's the frequency shift key. F, S, K, and with actually fast frequency shift key. So already in the first generation of mobile phones, it was a combination of analog data, the phone audio was analog, and uh, uh, digital data. So digitalization is basically when you transmit ones and zeros like this. And in 2G, 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 the second generation, that's also called GSM. And this is actually a French name, three French letters or words. In English, it's just the SMG, the Special Mobile Group, SMG, the corresponding French words, I can't really pronounce it, but it's something like group, special, mobile, something like that. So that was the name of the task force that created GSM standard. And they, they created, uh, transmitted audio digitally, and they also tra uh, compressed the audio uh, using the GSM codec, which is pretty advanced, but there are open source softwares which you can use to encode and decode the GSM audio codec. It was not um, transmitted in the clear anymore, like in the first generation, it was transmitted in the clear. You could pick up the phone call, call audio using a scanner and listen, listen to the phone call. Second generation, GSM, now the audio was encrypted. So it was much harder 
to to listen to the communications. Um, harder, but it turns out not impossible. In the 3G, third generation, and fourth generation, it is even harder. That is why um, if, uh, let's say, 2G is in one frequency range like this, and, and then 3G is another frequency range, and 4G is another frequency range, if you have, um, if you set, transmit data that disturbs the signals in this range here, uh, the phone will say, okay, I have no 3G connection and no 4G connection. I have to back down to 2G GSM. And now, 2G GSM, it is hard but not impossible to listen to the audio data. And uh, it turns out that the human ear is most sensitive around 1000 hertz. And 1000 hertz is also called 1 kilohertz. And then the sensitivity goes down like this, if this is a frequency range. And the whole uh, audible uh, frequency range is like down from 50 hertz up to maybe 20 kilohertz. So this is what's needed to be able to hear speech. So it's only a little part of the full audible spectrum range. All this. It's really unnecessary if you only want to hear what the person in the other end says. Says, okay? You only have to transmit this information here. And as you can imagine, if you don't need to transmit this information here, only transmit this information. This information can be uh, compressed. So you first uh, translate the audio into ones and zeros and leave out all that. It's only have this left and then you can compress the data more effectively. And that's a good thing because um, GSM doesn't have a very good bit rate, so you want to compress it. So maybe you have heard when you have a good connection uh, on the mobile phone, you can hear perfectly well what the person in the other end speaks, but then the, when the connection is worse, sometimes it sounds like a robot voice talking in the other end. And what happens then is that the GSM audio codec actually, uh, when you turn down the bit rate, it don't transmit as audio data at all. It only transmits this robot voice data, which uh, takes much less bandwidth. And when you have a good connection to the tower, cell phone tower, then it transmits uh, only audio data and you have poor connection but not very poor then it, con it transmits a um, mix between robot audio data and real sampled audio data yeah, and this is uh, you might think 1000 here 1 kilohertz so for instance a, ba a kick drum from a bass in a, a bass kick drum from a drum set, it might be down here around 100 hertz, 100 hertz. And uh, maybe a cymbal is somewhere about here. Cym cymbal. Maybe a bass guitar, it's, you know, here in this range here. Uh, and you won't hear a bass guitar very much if you only transmit this information. You won't hear a kick drum very much if you only transmit this. You won't hear a cymbal if you only transmit this. So it's actually very limited information that gets transmitted in the mobile phone audio data. And uh, maybe you have tried to play a song <laughs> and, and transmit it over mobile phone data. And you, you will probably experience this, that it's only... Uh, frequencies around the human speech, around 1000 hertz, that is being transmitted. So let's say you are in your car. <laughs> Driving around with a mobile phone here, in the car. Mobile phone. And you have uh, one radio tower here. <laughs> Another radio tower here. <laughs> the mobile phone is actually have one main tower it's communicating with, but it also communicates with this tower over here, just to see, okay, how good signal do I have with this tower? So I have better t better signal to this tower here, okay, so this is the main tower. So if I want to do a phone call, it will use this tower. And then if the car moves, when the car moves over here, at some point, the telephone will realize, hmm, 
Now it's closer to this tower than to this tower. Then uh, the telephone will start signaling to this tower and say, hey, I'm going to leave you now. I'm going to use this tower instead. So that's called a handover. So it does a handover from this tower over to this tower. Uh, and in the GSM, you could actually hear it in the car radio. When this ha handover happened, the signaling it sounded something like this. And you could actually hear that in the radio. So now one thing that's interesting is that even if you don't talk into the phone, the phone records how long it is to this tower, how long it is to this tower over here. And the towers also records, okay, this phone is this far away. Uh, and this tower also records, okay, this phone is this far away from me. And that information is stored in databases in the m mobile phone network. And that's what's called metadata. There are actually lots of different types of metadata, but that's one type of metadata that can be used to find the position of a mobile phone uh, by going back in time and check where a certain mobile phone was at a specific date and time. It transmits data to the phone and receives data from the phone. So it's a transceiver. So, that, so the tower is called a BTS. B T S and that stands for base transceiver sta station. Base transceiver station. So the base station here is actually two parts. First is the transmitter and receiver, and then there's the BSC base station controller, which controls uh, traffic in and out uh, to and from one or more BTSs and. Here is how it's all connected inside the mobile phone network. There is a lot of stuff happening inside the network. And this is for GSM. I think it's more complex for 3G and 4G. I don't know exactly, but if you go on Wikipedia, you can see that the basic stuff from GSM is also available in 3G and 4G, uh, but it's more complex. So if you understand GSM 2G, it's a good way to start. So I have this... Uh, MSC, which is the most important node, which controls the traffic in the mobile phone network. And this is connected to the HLR, HLR, the Home Location Register database, which has, is a database of all the home locations for all mobile phones. And the VLR, the Visitor Location Register, which I guess is when the phone is out and moving. It uh, keeps control of um, the movement of the mobile phones. And the uh, AUC, the, that's the authentication center here, is where all the secrets are. So if you're gonna crack the encryption, you, if you get to the AUC, you have the keys to the kingdom. And the uh, EIR uh, database is the equipment register. So it keeps track of all the mobile phones. So it's a lot of databases which communicates in each other in this way. Yeah, so the smallest area in the mobile phone network is called a cell. And then multiple cells uh, creates a traffic area. And multiple traffic area is one MSC area. So an MSC area can cover a large area. So for instance in Sweden in the 1990s, uh, when we only had the GSM and NMT networks, the GSM network had three MSC areas. I have no idea how it is now with 3G and 4G, but this was from the old 2G. This picture over here, here you can see how, much like what I tried to draw before, uh, you have neighbors here, don't have the same color, but every uh, cell with the one here have the same uh, frequencies. Every cell with the two here have the same frequencies, and every cell with the three here have the same frequencies. And they kind of overlap, but because they are using unique frequencies, they um, it should work. But if you have two neighboring cells with the same frequencies here, you will probably get some problem, I think. So in 1G, uh, yeah, each person, this rings in her heads, <laughs> talking heads, they have their own channels. So eight persons here use eight channels. And it's also why you could use a scanner to listen to each one of these eight uh, conversations unencrypted. In GSM, uh, eight people share one channel using this uh, time, what do you call it, time slots. 
Yeah. And um, in one there can be, I think, 13, uh, let's see, 13 channels. So you can have 13 times 4, that's 104 abonnants uh, that use one cell. So one uh, GSM uh, audio frame uh, encodes 20 milliseconds of audio data. Uh, so this uh, is encoded into 160 bits uh, and 50 of those bits are very, very important. So it's necessary to understand what the person is saying. Then there's 132 bits that are less important, but they're still important. And they give uh, the voice in the transmitted audio uh, a personal character and then there's 78 even less important bits that just uh, contains nuances in the speech and then it's encoded in some uh, complex way but to minimize the number of bits that's necessary for instance the sample rate is 8 kilohertz that's the number of times per second that you read the audio data and you, you don't encode the actual audio data as it is but you use what's called a delta encoding that just uh, uh, contains the difference to the previous sample and so on and then uh, you increase the frame to 456 bits by adding um, parity bits and uh, uh, error correcting codes and so on and so forth and then these 456 bits are interleaved into eight frames so if one frame is not transmitted you can still get uh, maybe the most important bits through some of these uh, important bits, but maybe these are lost, these 7 to 8 bits here at the end. All right. So, the full chain for encoding, analog to digital conversion. You first you do segmentation, speech encoding, channel encoding, and interleaving, and then encrypting the data with the um, uh, encryption key that's stored in the SIM card, card of the phone and in the authentication center. Then some, uh, I don't know what that's, that is actually, and then you you, you do this modulating uh, before transmitting, and then the receiver on the receiving end, you do the inverse, the demodulation, and then do this Viterbi stuff, which I guess uh, is the opposite of this, which I don't know what it does, but maybe if you go to Wikipedia and read about the Viterbi encoding, you can understand what happens here. Then you do decryption, deinterleaving, to get this uh, 456 bit frame back, and then the Viterbi decoder and speech decoding, and then finally digital to audio conversion and the audio is played back in the phone speaker. And this picture shows what happens when you turn on the phone. First, there is an update request to the mobile switching center and this main, the most important device here, which updates, uh, sends an update location location area request to the visitor location register, which in turn sets an update location request to the uh, home location register. And then there is an acknowledgement going back and you are up and can begin making phone calls and so on. And the encryption happens like this. First, the uh, MSC uh, generates a random number. And then the telephone, which has a stored key on the SIM card, uh, uses that random number and an algorithm and uh, calculates si signed response and sends over uh, to the network and the network takes the stored uh, KI uh, and the random number and calculates uh, the uh, signed response and then compares if it's the same signed response. And the algorithm used, I think it's called A5. And if you go to Wikipedia, you can see the A5 uh, article, and here are details about how how this algorithm works to calculate the signed uh, response. Uh, and uh, A51 was replaced by A52, uh, but mobile phones have to support both A51 and A52, uh, but. I think, yeah, this was some controversy around this. You can read about the controversy too, but I think um, the new algorithm, A52, was even worse than A51. And then it turned out uh, like uh, poor countries like had this worse algorithm in the, their SIM cards. And the rich countries in the West had this better, more secure algorithm in, in their SIM cards. But the mobile phones themselves has to be able to... Uh, 
to use uh, both algorithm. Then there was a third, yeah, this can also be attacked. I don't remember now which one is more secure, if I want to or three, but you can go and read about it here on Wikipedia. KI here contains information if, uh, if I want two or three are to be used. Uh, and the random number plus KI here, uh, uh, using those two you can calculate a KC, and the KC is the actual session key that is used in this uh, session. And every time you uh, reconnect, you get a, a new random number and a new KC. But KI is always the same, and KI is stored in the network, in the authentication center, and on the SIM card on the mobile phone. And of course you have this PSTN, that's the old uh, telephone network, the public switch telephone network, you know, which you had before mobile phones. And uh, you can still, in some places, use these old PSTN networks and call a mobile phone. Yeah, then there's switching happening here. You have the MSC, the VLR, the HLR and uh, the BSC, which, yeah, the BSC, yeah, that, that was the base station controller, and then these BTS are the transceivers.